How do business improvement districts create better cities? Well, Jace Tyrrell is an expert on building them and is also the inaugural CEO of Australia's very first business improvement district, the new Sydney Waterfront Company. He joins me now to discuss this. Jace Tyrrell, welcome to Smarter Cities. Thank you, Jason. Great to be here. Great to have you on. Now, uh, dear viewers and listeners, I will apologize in advance for my voice, which has gone a little bit odd. Um, but we're going to persevere as we discuss this uh, really cool topic. Um, Jace, welcome firstly to Australia. You've been here, I think, three or four months now. Mm. Um, you are originally Australian, so it's great to welcome, welcome you home. Before we get into it, I, you know, this whole concept of how the private sector unites around creating better places is something I'm really passionate about mm. and excited about. And that's why uh, we at Lend Lease have been thrilled to be an inaugural sponsor um, and board, a member of the board of the New City Waterfront Company. But before we get into all of that, it's a pretty niche space. Right? How did you <laughs> end up being a CEO of a business improvement district? Look, apologies to the accent as well, because I am Australian, but obviously it wouldn't sound like it. But hopefully this time next year, Jason, yeah, you have to be... fit in in London. Was that the idea? <laughs> exactly was... right. And I'll come back and get the Aussie twang going pretty soon, hopefully. But um, look, it is niche. And I started out up in Queensland. Uh, I actually read constitutional law, so I thought I was going to be a lawyer and do some really interesting stuff in, in constitution, but got into this space of people and places and urban regeneration. Uh, so changed over into a business degree, actually, and started out at South Bank Corporation uh, in Brisbane, which was oh, the old okay. expo site. Um, incredible public space. It's gone through massive regeneration and master planning. As I did that, worked on the Olympics here in Sydney, like everybody else. I'm surprised I didn't work at lend because everyone else in Sydney has worked at lend <laughs> as well. Yeah. Uh, but then ventured over to the UK and, and got into this space of improvement districts and worked at uh, New West End Company, which was the first you know, in, in Europe, actually, of this improvement district model, which is bringing together all the property owners, all the businesses around a precinct vision and, and plan to deliver. And it is niche because actually it's unique to get the private sector working in this way. So I did a couple of stints at New West End Company, worked on um, property and re renewal and planning in the centre of London for a while, and also worked on some projects in mainland China and Singapore and Gibraltar but really excited to bring the improvement district model back to Australia or to Australia, because really I think we're crying out for a new way to self-organize and to bring the private sector together in places and spaces as well. So uh, 25 years overseas, bringing all the IP back here and great to be part of the first in Australia. And hopefully there'll be many more improvement districts as we roll out uh, in the years ahead as well. I want to get into that as well, because I think you've been doing a bit of a tour of different cities mm. recently around this. But, but before we, we go there, is it a, what is it about this that captures your imagination? Is it the property aspect? Is it the people aspect? Is it the city aspect? Yeah. What is it that sort of captures you? I think there's always a, a great debate in cities and places around the world of who has license, who operates these. Is it the public sector uh, with the planning and the regulation and sort of the management and enhancement of these spaces? Or is it the, the property owners, the operators, the institutions, the organisation? And really it's both. It's not either or, actually. And you need to get both in terms of thinking about the space and the places, thinking about some outcomes, whether they're economic or they're social uh, or other outcomes you're trying to achieve for an area. So, you know, the improvement district model has been around for about 50 years now, and there's over 2,000 around the world in all types and sizes and sectors and spaces. So I think as someone that really is interested in business and how business can play a role, you know, in places, in society, uh, in improving outcomes for the area with the government, in really complicated stakeholder sets. And it's pretty complicated here in Sydney, I have to say, with a lot of different <laughs> yeah. agencies in a similar space of placemaking as well. I think really unlocking that and delivering some outcomes that are tangible and getting the private sector to think beyond their asset, beyond their own operation, to get some good outcomes as well, great outcomes, it is really interesting. And I think also for Australia, we're almost in this is period of bids 2.0, if you like. They've been around for 50 years. But I think the challenges we're facing here post-COVID, the future of CBDs, uh, the big pressure on social and environmental outcomes in pretty rapid space of time to get there. Uh, the id model, the improvement district model, really lends itself to actually delivering against them. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I, I spend so much time in, in this space mm. talking to government, talking to other private sector parties to try and get shared outcomes in particular mm. spaces. And I think the more collaborative models we can get, whether it's through an improvement district or through a joint owners committee or through whatever it might be, um, or through even an you know, intergovernmental private sector committee. Those are things that you know, just talking to one another actually yes. ends up with some results. 
Totally. And, and if, you know, if everyone stays 10 paces apart, you never get anywhere. Correct. And one of the challenges of having many agencies and many investors, many companies mm. in a space is getting them all onto a, a level playing field yeah. where you can have a sensible discussion, right? So that's the attractive thing, I think, mm. about the improvement district model. And I want to get into the mechanics of it mm. uh, in a second. But one of the questions I really wanted to understand is what is the difference between a business improvement district and a mm. special economic zone. Mm. So we've heard like, a lot about special economic zones, mm. right? We were proposing one for, for uh, Western Sydney Airport, for example. We oh. thought that would be a good place for you know, the government to provide lots of incentives to attract industry or whatever. What's the difference? I think it's really sort of top down or, or bottom up. So I think these investment zones, and there's all different types around the world where they're looking really from top down government measures, whether it's tax incentives, whether it's you know, different financing, tax increment financing, whether it's the levers of the state effectively to try and unlock economic development or infrastructure in a space where improvement districts are really bottom up. So listening to the businesses, the, the owners, the different organisations, you know, that are both public and private sector, what is going to help them achieve their outcomes on the ground effectively as well. So I think there's this excellent space where the bid is sort of providing that from the bottom up, getting that coalition of, you know, businesses and the public sector working together. You know, the dream is probably a bid within an economic zone, actually, yeah. where you've got both in parallel, agreeing a big vision for that place of what you want to achieve with some outcomes, but also putting in some really good government governance, but also capital investment from all the players in that space as well to deliver on those outcomes. So so I think they can work together, uh, but I think there's obviously been a need for bids around the world because you know, some of the stuff at the top wasn't delivering some of those results on the ground as well. And sometimes some of these results from you know, investment zones or special enterprise areas, whatever they are, they take you know, perhaps two decades to get mm. there. And for the property industry, you're looking in cycles and decades is absolutely fine. But for the operators, for the customers, for the end users, they need to see some results in quicker time actually to get into the long-term aspirations you're trying to achieve as well. So the bid can play in that space in the short to medium term with the aspiration for the long term as well. What was the impetus for, for the new West End company that you've mm. just come from? You've, you've told the story and I, I think I'd encourage you to tell the story here of how it was created mm. and why it was created and what these sort of outcomes have been. Yeah. Because I think that would be a good example in this discussion of top down, bottom up, of why the bottom up exists. Yeah. I mean, uh, New West End Company, so hopefully your listeners will know it's Bond Street, Oxford Street and Regent Street. So I like to say the best bit of the Monopoly board uh, <laughs> and, and one of the largest areas. I always like the green ones. That's where I made money. Always totally. The, oh, a few hotels, right? Green ones. Never bought Mayfair. <laughs> no. Didn't think, it was, didn't think it was good value. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, better values, I think, in the centre as well. Actually. Quicker so. returns, quicker returns. Um, and really it was responding at the time, I think it was the late 90s, early noughties. And these out-of-town shopping centres, I think it was Lendley's with Blue Water, actually, mm. at the time some great pressure on the centre of London and where customers want to go, where they want to be. And these streets were looking pretty tired, actually. Retail was going through change then, effectively, out of town. And it was really an enlightened group of property owners, very similar to what we've got here in the New Sydney waterfront, that came together and said, we've got to self-organise. We've got to work better as a precinct. We've got to think about the sum of the parts and the collective endeavour. And they looked around the world, the, these property companies and these big owner occupiers like Selfridges and, and Marks and Spencer and John Lewis with people like the Crown Estate in Grosvenor, uh, and sort of said, well, actually, what is the best model for us to organise? And they looked at REIT examples, they looked at TIFFs, but actually they wanted to get sustainable income from the operators as well. So the bids was a really good example of that. And the challenge at the time was actually to maintain market share as much as possible with more competition, but also just to clean up the environment. The council were doing an OK job, but they were pretty struck with actually not having much of the business rates they were receiving. So a bit like New York where bids started out, there was an agenda to clean the place up, make it safer, but then also to market it as one destination because you had each street competing against each other and we were just bleeding from each other rather than trying to grow the whole pie, which is what the bid is aiming to do. So they were some of the issues then. And then I went off and did some other work with the, um, the Property Association for a while, looking at different sort of policies to improve urban environments. So when I came back to New West End Company, the challenges had changed. We were in a different world sort of 10 years later. And it was around the sustainability agenda. So the area already had an identity by that point? Very strong identity, and the Western International Centre was created where we got new policy. We were marketing at both B2C and B2B. We had a whole wave of new different occupiers coming in beyond retail as well. But then very quickly we realised we need to be, get some big capital programmes off the ground. We need to improve the public realm for the long term. We need to maximise 
the Elizabeth Line, which is an amazing infrastructure project, a bit like here with three metro stations yeah. coming in, you know, and it was more long term. So it was the CapEx program, the policy environment, because actually the marketing was strong. Customers were coming back. We took a, a five billion turnover precinct to a seven billion turnover precinct within five years. So I hope we can replicate some of that magic here mm. uh, in Sydney as well. But as I was leaving London, we were getting into sustainability, into net zero, into employment programs. So I think the beauty of the model is it can be really agile, responding to the needs of the business community primarily, but also the other stakeholders. But where did you of get the money want. to? Sorry to interrupt you. Where did mm. you get the money to run the new West End company? Like where, how did you manage to run all these programs? Somebody must have paid for it. Yeah, it's the the businesses. So the the basic premise of the improvement district model. They're not for profit. So every penny uh, or dollar you're getting goes into sort of enhancing and reinvesting into the area. But effectively, it's an investment from all the owners and all the occupiers that are participating. So the way it works, you take a business proposal to these businesses. In our case, in London, we had about 600 businesses, so 200 property owners, 400 occupiers from galleries to restaurants to hotels to retailers. Okay, so separated by different types of, of sector. Completely. But in the precinct. Within the precinct. And the beauty is you capture all of those businesses and types as well. And you vote, basically. You go to them and say, here's our business proposal. Are you in favour of this? Are you willing to contribute towards funding this? And if majority vote in favour, and we had 98% at our last ballot, uh, everyone is invested in that for the next five years. And therefore, you can raise capital collectively. And we're raising about £10 million a year to invest in a range of programmes and services uh, for the precinct, which is to benefit those investing as well. And that will be absolutely the model that we'll replicate here in Australia. So also. that runs your operations cost, but then gives you a, a pool of funding to then do small capital works in the precinct? It does, but actually it leverages a lot of other public money. So ah, that's where I was going, right? Because £10 million pounds yes. is, is great, but can you really do a capital program with that? Absolutely not. So the ability of the bid to fundraise collectively above and beyond that levy. So we did some amazing projects in Bond Street and Mayfair on the back of the Elizabeth Line opening. And we raised about £225 million pounds, uh, in the last sort of five years on major capital projects where the property owners were topping up their investment to deliver collectively. And also we were leveraging a huge amount from the city council and the mayor as well. So again, thinking about the Western Harbour here, there may be a number of projects where you're right, the bid can deliver operational services and insights, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But actually, there may be projects where you want to co-invest together, where the bid can be that banker to leverage public money with others to deliver some big projects. Because the well. Elizabeth Line is a great parallel, because you know, the Elizabeth Station, mm. as I understand it, the, the businesses around that station made sure the place was at a standard when the station opened that would improve visitation, improve retail spend, mm. improve multiple visitation, all that stuff, right? We have that opportunity here with Sydney Metro um, CBD Southeast yeah. Yeah, and Sydney Metro West, particularly around White Bay, mm. Piermont Station, Hunter Street Station, all of these wonderful projects where the agency itself, Sydney Metro, is talking about place, mm. but actually the, the bid concept is beyond the concentric circle of the station itself and, and beyond that. So I think the Elizabeth Line example is a good one because mm. um, it shows what a collective of businesses do can do. My only question is, in the Elizabeth case, the businesses were already there. Mm. In the Western Harbour case, we're here, yes. but there's lots of empty bits, yes. right? So White Bay, for example, yeah. where there'll be a wonderful new station. There's nothing at yet. the moment. Yet. Yeah? Yes. There's a power station, yes. uh, heritage power station, there's nothing yet. Mm. How, do you, how do you translate that experience from London to here, given this context is different? Yeah. So I think you're, you're spot on with your observation because the Elizabeth Lion had a 16 billion pound project, you know, amazing stations, oversight developments. And to be fair to Sydney Metro, and I've met a number of the colleagues there now, they are really thinking about those stations. But you're right, it's the immediate block and they're thinking about how to operate a really good transport network. And I think what we have to do collectively, and we did this really well in London to show what is the value of greater investment in the public realm? What is the opportunity for a whole bunch of new occupiers to come to this space? How can we increase the turnover and the values? And one really good example of that was Bond Street. So it was looking really tired 
uh, pre-Elizabeth line coming to central London. And we thought there's such an opportunity here with, with a station right there, 100 metres from Bond Street. You're literally 28 minutes from Heathrow into Bond Street, effectively. How can we really enhance the whole street? And it was complicated. We had 60 different property owners of all types and sizes from around the world, from the, um, the great estates. We had about 100 different uh, occupiers, owner occupiers, so Richmond and Kering and Louis Vuitton, quite a luxury premium street. And they were thinking about their own buildings, but not around all the public realm and that connectivity. And the Elizabeth Line would only go so far. They would do their station, they'd do the immediate yeah, exactly. bit. So we said, come on, let's actually put the business case together. Let's set a vision for what this East Mayfair Bond Street could be in the future. Let's raise the capital. And we did. You know, it took about seven years from start to finish. We raised 10 million pounds from the public and private sector. If anyone's been to London recently and been down to Bond Street, people tell me it's like going to the High Line. It's something you must visit now. But the results are tremendous. In terms of turnover, we increased turnover by 15%. Uh, in terms of the enhancements to the streetscape, to the new town square, all the public art that we created, and values by about 12%. And those figures were pre-COVID, I'll caveat. Mm. But if you ever wanted a, a business case and a case study in terms of where that collective investment, where the bid really drove that in terms of the fundraising, the outcomes we were seeking, the design and the cost control with the private sector, very much with the city council and the mayor, None of this could be done without the public sector, and I'm sure it's the same here as well. But there is a fantastic example where you can really get long-term value by co-investing and working collaboratively. So I think for us, with three new metro stations coming, $10 billion of investment in this precinct, which is absolutely remarkable for Australian standards and the region, I would say. You know, we've got to think about some of these sites and the wider footprint of what we can do collectively. And now is the time to really start thinking about that quite deeply. But who executed so you, you had your business case, you raised your money. Mm. Who executed the work? Well, it's done with the city council, with their contractors. So, so they, they executed the work. And it, so they basically took the plan mm. and said, OK, I'm now, gonna, I'm now basically going to development manage this, this work. It was a really interesting governance because we, because we were funding half of this, we were at the table. So we sat there as an advisory board looking at the quality of the design because Often with the city council or public sector, there's a standard they'll get to. But if you want to enhance that, and the whole premise of the bid is you're going above and beyond the public sector. We wanted higher quality design, better materials. We wanted the public art. And because we were putting half the capital up, we had that role in that governance. So it was very unique. We're obviously working with the contractors, which are the city council. But we were there with cost control. We had the private sector looking at all the numbers, managing the process of the program as well. So it's very unique for the public and private sector to work together in that way. So it's almost a form of PPP without the contractual um, the contractual governance of a special purpose vehicle. Correct. Because this wasn't a special purpose vehicle. This was kind of a almost a joint venture Correct. type model. Exactly right. right. Exactly. Except it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have thought legally it was a joint venture. It was just the city council uh, executing a plan, but in some form of joint owners committee model. Yeah, and it is, you know, the PPP is a good example, actually, although they often have different outcomes yes. as well because they're borrowing yeah. against it, Correct. where this we have capital up front to deliver against it as well. But uh, I think it's unique, and I think it's a fantastic model that should be replicated in other parts of the world also, you know, to deliver on these longer-term multi-ownership precincts, actually, where it can be complicated with the different players. So I think that's, that's a good segue into what we're trying to do in Australia and in mm. Sydney in particular. So the journey towards the new Sydney Waterfront Company, um, <laughs> which you know you're now the, the spearhead of. Um, why do we need it? What is the purpose of this thing? Like you know, this mm. is all great. London's great. Yes. You know, whatever. But why do we need this here? Aren't we perfect already? Well, some would say that. <laughs> and it's been interesting going around Sydney, I think 100 meetings in the last six weeks, right? And everyone, everyone's got a view about the Western Harbour, which is very interesting. Everyone's got a view about improvement districts and placemaking. Everyone's a placemaker, I find, yeah. uh, in Sydney. That's right. And there's bits of that that are really strong as well. But I think... Um, it's a badge we all wear with pride. I'm a placemaker. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I just ruined my mic. Anyway, um, yeah. And I think I mean, Jeff Parmenter, who's our brilliant chairman of the New Sydney Waterfront, he's been on quite a journey, almost for a decade, I think with the, the, the predecessor, which was the Alliance, I think, for the Western Harbour. I think there's always been a desire to bring the public and private se sector together in this place. But how was the question? Well, what is the Western Harbour? What is it really? Well, I think it's what we define it as at the moment. But I think everyone, again, has a view of what the Western Harbour is. But for the sake of the new Sydney waterfront bid, we're talking everything from Walsh Bay Arts Precinct all the way to the Sydney Fish Market and probably beyond. Because if the bays get going and there's commercial activity there and leisure and everything else, we might extend. So 
I would think we say we are the Western Harbour. And actually, if you look at the whole harbour of Sydney, there is a concentration of activity here that is, again, really quite remarkable and unprecedented what's about to happen here in the next decade. So we are talking about that precinct. Some people argue actually it's a very large precinct and actually we're taking well, more than we can actually deliver against. But sort of the response factor to that is we want our customers to come to this bit of Sydney. We want our customers to go from, you know, from the Opera House all the way to the Sydney Fish Market to follow that, that cultural ribbon for all the sub-precincts to do well. And improvement districts can be very large or small, but Dublin, the whole city of Dublin is an improvement district. Right. So I think because of the, the I mean, sheer... Ireland, though, like there's not that many people there in the first place. Well, <laughs> maybe on par with Sydney no, <laughs> in terms true. of the numbers. Millions, yeah. we're talking millions. I know. I'm, just I'm just joking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that, that connectivity piece across the bay, through the sub-precincts, everyone is, it wants that to be successful. And I think with that level of investment that's happening, you've got to get a return on that investment. Why are we building three metro stations here? We want this whole precinct to be successful as well. So that is the area that we're talking about here. For the I mean, when I, when I reflect on it, I haven't been in Sydney for 20 odd years now. Mm. The, if you come to this city and you have three days, mm. at the moment, you wouldn't come to this part of Sydney. You might come to, so you definitely go to the Opera House. Yes. You definitely go to, to, um, see the bridge mm. you might do bridge climb which is a wonderful thing yeah you might if you're artistically minded go across to you know the art gallery and up to mrs mccoy's chair so that yeah. you know you might do that um and then you, you might come to barangaroo like this area down here the um uh, restaurant uh, district mm. that we have here at barangaroo is one of the top in sydney beautiful food good mix i've been to a know. good few of them now yes <laughs> I, I imagine you know you might go to crown yes like some beautiful stuff there um and then you're probably off to the beach. Yes. Right. So you're kind of done in the Sydney CBD. Correct. Um, and yet this part of the harbour mm. is really somewhere where it could be potentially another tourist thing, right? So um, one of the things you know I've been reflecting on is the beauty of the White Bay Power Station. Mm. That thing is a unique building in Australia. Uh, in Sydney at least, and certainly has the potential to be an iconic destination, an iconic arts and culture hub. It's heritage Absolutely. listed, yes. it's gonna be there, it's gonna have a metro station right next to it, yeah. it's going to have residential, it's gonna have commercial, it's gonna be a new hub. So why I'm passionate about the Western Harbour and mm. you know, uh, and Len Lease is passionate about the Western Harbour is we've been here a long time, you know, we started with the Bond, Barangaroo obviously is, is one of, uh, of the city's great achievements. Again, the Bond created the beginning of the West. You look at Darling Harbour yes. and the Convention Centre, the brand new residential precinct there that's you know, changed that whole area that was very tired before. Mm. Um, you know, Mervac's got a great new development coming up at Harbourside, which mm. is a great achievement um, with what is a very tired shopping centre at the moment. Mm. Um, although my kids do like the ice cream there. <laughs> great. Um, and my cousin actually owns <laughs> part of the ice cream shop, oh, but so there you go. Uh, that's why they like it, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's changing as well. Mm. So there, as you say, there's an um, immense amount of change. GPT's got a cool development coming up, uh, you know, a renewal of, of that Darling Harbour, Darling Park area, which actually then- And then the Powerhouse as well. Powerhouse, powerhouse yeah. as well. So there's all this stuff going on. Mm. And I think from my perspective, our perspective generally is, and the point you made earlier around identity, mm. we don't really have an identity for this area. Correct. Like if I was to say go to a place, yes, you could say go to Barangaroo. Yes. Right. If I said go to Darling Harbour, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Or go to the Western Harbour even. You go know? to the Western Harbour. Yeah. What does that actually Correct. mean? Correct. Correct. And so, if you listen to Jeff, mm. who you know, has been on this journey longer than anyone, he talks about you know the idea of, you know, a unified uh, a, a unified idea. Like maybe we have seafood month. Yes, yes, right? yes. I don't know, he's really into seafood, I think, because he talks about that. Very much he is. <laughs> so is that, is that the idea? Is that what we're trying to do? Yeah, look, I, I think you're spot on with your observation, actually. And let's say there are some really good assets here. So let's not downplay this area as well. I mean, there's some very good places. There's some, you know, really good parts of this precinct, but we want to make it great. And actually, you're spot on with that observation and with Jeff as well. We need to create a reason to come here for Sydney Siders and for our tourists, actually. And from the, the data work that we've done already, and we're getting really into this in the next couple of months, the detail of what our customers do and think about this precinct and our visitors, not just the consumers, but everyone that comes here. 
only 25% uh, of people return here when they come to Sydney, actually. Our locals are very transactional. They come to Great Barangaroo, they go to the Crown, they go to the Convention Centre, but they're leaving, they're not staying. They're not so, they're going home after that, right? Correct. Yeah. So we're not sticky as a precinct. And I'd say we're quite vanilla as a precinct. There isn't a great reason to come here. So you talk about Opera House and the bridge. The next thing should be the powerhouse or the Sydney fish exactly. market. It should be on everyone's list when you come to Sydney and for every Sydney cider as well. So we've got to create those big anchors. We've got to lift the whole quality of the experience up. We've got to make sure it's accessible to all users of every price point. And that point that you and Jeff and others make absolutely right. We've got to find a unifying way that people know what this precinct is and what it stands for and why you're coming here as well. And that's why you need the bid quite frankly because actually you know what is the problem we're trying to solve you've touched on that we want this precinct to be great we want it to be a really high performing place and we want everybody to come and visit here you know Sydney Australia and around the world and that's why our work is really cut out in this next decade to achieve that I mean it's interesting you say that as well I I think of it a bit in terms of that you know slogan at the bottom of uh, of of retail um, shopping bags you know London mm. Paris New York Hong Kong, mm. Singapore, Sydney. <laughs> yeah. How do we how do we get on that list, mm. right? Usually it's London, Paris, New York, yeah. Tokyo or yes, something like that. Yeah, yeah. When do we get on that list? And if you come to Sydney, mm. you know, what is that anchor destination that you go to, right? What is you know, can White Bay be that arts and mm. culture hub mm. where you must go to see a show mm. like you would go to the West End or like you would go to Broadway. Like if you're in New York, you go to Broadway. Yes, right? yes, yes. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm much more in favor of this webbing concept in cities now than mm. I think I was 10 years ago, where I thought, you know, arts and culture is great, everyone loves it, but you know, what we need is more commercial yes. stuff, more infrastructure, right? Yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. like, actually- Build it, they will come, right? Build it, they will come. And I've sort of realized now this whole concept of webbing yes. in a city is so important. Yes. You, you, need, you need arts and culture. Totally. You need um, really interesting cheap eat places to go to totally. because that's really far more fun than mm. fine dining all the time. And actually use an example in Sydney. Mm. When I first moved here, um, there, was a, um, there was a decision the government had made around poker machines oh, yeah. that had uh, basically encouraged clubs and pubs to really center a lot of poker machines in one big venue. And so you had these huge venues yeah. And, you know, there were sort of big dance clubs and, and sort of clubby sort of places. And there was no character these, to these places, right? The, the pub mm. was a dying institution. Live music was a dying institution because all the money was going into these large, yes. large venues. Yes. And it also changed the culture of the city mm. away, from, uh, away from a sort of social um, experience to one where you were kind of in these big big clubs, right? Um, and you weren't going outside. And you weren't going outside, Correct. right? There, you, know, you weren't, rooftops yes. weren't a thing. Yes. Um, you know, beer gardens weren't a thing. Like it was, it was, I don't think I very really one realized dimensional, it. Right? It was very one dimensional. Yeah. And I think the city realized that mm. and looked at places like Melbourne with its small bars, laneways. And, yes. And, and one thing the, the Lord Mayor of Sydney has been passionate about and all credit to her was saying, we can't go on like this. Yes. We need to restore the culture of our city. Right. And the small bar policy has paid massive dividends for the city to sort of focus on creating laneways. You know, we've got some really great laneways here at Barangaroo, yes. at Darling Harbour, at Darling Square, same thing. That sort of Piermont as well, what an amazing Piermont. space. Like, yeah. um, these are things that the bid can really, uh, can really come across now. Absolutely right. And I put that, that problem mm. uh, when I first moved here around these big venues, that is entirely a failure of government policy. Yes. Because that poker machine policy- Just Locked them that, in. <laughs> locked yeah. them in, right? Yeah, yes. Um, and it took it took a, a political leader to set an ambition for the city- Yes. To fix it. That's yeah. what she did and all credit to her and I think it's fantastic. Um, but it wasn't, wasn't as vocal as it probably should have been around these issues. Correct. And that's what attracts me about the bid. Do you see the bid as an opportunity for the industry to set ambition? Completely right. And actually, I think that's a really good example. We've met recently with a new sort of chair and chief executive of the, of the staff. 
and obviously they're going through some changes at the moment, but they talk, and, and I really believe it's through the management team now. They talk about the wider precinct, about the fact they are logged in. It was about everything being inside of their building rather than what happens outside. And I think they're really going to think quite deeply around what that means for their wider precinct. How do they actually create the outdoor and the through experience and the connection to the neighborhood as well? And you know, the bid is really there to push every single developer, every single owner, every single operator to think differently about how they operate here, how they develop here as well, to create greater value for the entire precinct and I think we should get a shout out here to, to Clover Moore and the City of Sydney and also to Place Making New South Wales, Anita Mitchell and the team and, and others in government because they do think about this and they do want these outcomes and I know they're thinking long and hard about the next 10, 20, 30 years for Sydney so I think what we need to do is find that space where they set the policy, the ambition from the public sector and how does the private sector through the bid respond to that to get the outcomes and I think you know working in London, working in Singapore, working in Gibraltar I've seen some really good examples where the private sector has set, stepped up and they've thought differently and they've used the evidence to make those business decisions which is where I think we can create some real value here as well and I think we should also think about culture in the broader sense because you know we've done some work with a company called Cultural Capital that's looked at our great cultural assets here from the Maritime Museum, the Powerhouse Foundation Theatre in Walsh Bay and how do you link this whole ribbon how do we think about our First Nations really in particular because remember this place has been the home of gathering and culture in the broader sense since millennia so how do we interpret that in the new way and we had a conversation with Cultural Capital that's done some work with First Nations on this and they they refer to Sydney side as the saltwater people they think everyone in Sydney whether you are from Aboriginal background or from broader you are saltwater people as well and there's something really fascinating around how we can create the saltwater promenade if you like mm. along the Western Harbour using culture as our ribbon which of course benefits everyone that lives here that works here that visits here as well so this is very early thinking uh, Jason but I hope there's something in that that we can really I coalesce visions around. Of the visions of the yellow brick road <laughs> through <laughs> the waterfront. The, water yeah, yeah, yeah. the saltwater road I like exactly it. Exactly right like exactly. It. I, I think this concept of ambition is an interesting mm. one, right? Because normally you rely on, you know, political leaders to mm. set ambition for a nation or mm. a state mm. or a city. But you rely on, on the civil service to set that, how that vision is operationalized. And executed. And executed, yeah. right? How do we as a private sector mm. contribute to that, participate in that? Mm. Like, what is the way we do that? And I think... The bid is that way, mm. in my mind. Yes. Because I think as individuals, you can you can voice a view, you know, all of us give plenty of talks and yes. speeches and whatever else, you know, we might articulate a that. Thought leadership. Thought leadership, <laughs> yeah. we might write an article or something. Yeah. But how do you do it in a collaborative and consistent way? I, I find it interesting, for example, that, you know, around the board table, you mm. have, um, you know, senior leaders of all of the major property people yes. together, which, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily see unless you were at a, I don't know, cocktail party show. or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, you know, and, and normally, I mean, there are examples where we are in, in commercial relationships with one another in, in yes. different projects, um, uh, as, you know, uh, and, and that's it's pretty common, but, mm. um, and becoming more common yes. in, this, in, in this investment environment where more and more is based on partnership. Mm. But not in a forum where we're actually saying, you know, here are, Here's a unified voice of the industry and not in a way where you actually have a capital contribution. So I think one of yes. the things I've been pretty strong on on the board is I don't want this to be a lobby group. Correct. Like I'm not interested in this being a lobby group. It yes. actually has to, it, it has to actually have a seat at the table in a monetary and financial sense. In Correct. other words, you've got to raise capital to do something. Correct. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head, exactly that. You've got to raise collective capital so you can actually deliver some stuff rather than just talk about what you want to achieve. And you're right, we're not a lobby group because there's a lot of industry groups there, but we're certainly advocates for our precincts. And the beauty of the bid model is you're bringing a whole bunch of different sectors together to advocate for a place as well. But equally, you know, sitting around the board table, sitting around the membership of the bid, you're going to have competitors coming together. And it was very unique in London, in Singapore. You know, historically, you wouldn't get those people in the room. They're all fighting for their little bit. But we have to lift everyone's ambition beyond their asset, beyond their business thing. Actually, if we grow the whole pie, which we're trying to do here, if we have that ambition, uh, we can all benefit from that. And it takes a new way of thinking. It's very difficult culturally sometimes to form a coalition like that, to work differently. The bid model gives you really good governance and sustainable income, which helps 
because often these organizations, they burn out after time. They're voluntary, it's the people involved, but they only get so far, which is why I think only sort of 20% of those organizations actually get anywhere. The bid model, and that's why there's again 2,000 around the world and why they keep getting renewed time and time again, is because there is value, there's collective investment, and there's, I think, a really important vision for the outcome as well that is with the public sector. So you've got evidence-led foundation, which is the head, and you've got the vision, which is the heart, and then you've got a range of programs where you're delivering incremental improvements to that place based on what you're trying to achieve over the time, which is the beauty of the model when it comes to But I think about. there's another element to it, which is there's a legislative basis to yes. this thing, right? So, yes. you know, what you've done here at the moment, there's a white paper out about what type of legislation might work here. Maybe you might want to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's really important this enabling legislation is in place because, again, working around the world with improvement districts, unless it is in legislation and regulated there, you will only get so far through a voluntary mechanism. And Rob Stokes has really pushed this, right? Absolutely brilliant. You know, Rob Stokes has championed the improvement district. It's great that New South Wales is Also first. a guest on this podcast previously. I oh, very, I'm yeah. in very good company then, being <laughs> on here, Jason. Yeah. Uh, but I think equally here, it's bipartisan. So we've met with the Labour Group here. We've met with independents as well. And across the world, it's supported by all spectrums of politics in terms of delivering this. But you need legislation. And it's not a tax on business. It often gets paraphrased as that. This only happens if businesses want to invest collectively. If the business proposal is sound enough that they feel there's going to be a collective return on their investment, then they vote for it. And if majority vote in favour because you have the legislation, then that enables the bid to take place. So it's fantastic how fast Minister Stokes is moving on this, actually. Uh, and I hope within the next six or 12 months, legislation will stand up here, which sets us on a trajectory to be one of the first bids formally by 2025. But I do think, talking to many people in Sydney, this id model is going to be uh, in all shapes and sizes around, around the state, but also the country. And people talking about in community improvement districts, sustainability improvement districts, uh, heritage improvement districts, health improvement districts, tech improvement districts. Yeah. A mechanism to solve a particular problem. Exactly right. Through a precinct and through the sectors there. So I hope we can be a shining light of example with the scale of what we're doing here. We're probably a mega bid in what we're trying to do here. But actually that model of governance, that legislation that enables that will certainly fast track a lot more of this uh, around the state and the country hopefully as well. So, you know, it's interesting since joining you and Jeff on this journey, mm. you know, I've started advocating for a bid model for Kembla, for example, oh, for yes. Kembla because there's a highly high likelihood that that will become a centre of of, uh, of national defence and then lease is a big yes. defence um, uh, contributor. We mm. know we do a lot of work for the Department of Defence, and you know when you put a new defence asset in a place, yes, it's not just that asset. There are a whole bunch of supply chain elements to it. Yes. It changes the city completely. You know, there's a whole new population that moves in there. There are and all the things that come with it, schools and hospitals. Totally. And the community infrastructure, community infrastructure. Yeah. And it changes yeah. the whole city, right? Yes, yes. Um, if you look then at the, the whole government plan for New South Wales around six cities, yes, um, that lends itself to a business improvement district also, like one in Newcastle, totally. potentially one in the Central Coast, right? Uh, you know, the Central Coast is a bit like London and Birmingham yes. between Sydney and the Central Coast, you know, Birmingham, who would have thought Birmingham yes. would start becoming part of London? Yes, completely. And it is. It is, right. Seen as that, the it's extra neighbourhood, Zone 7, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, um, in, in fact, our, uh, our, our, our MD of development in, um, in London is a Birmingham girl, and so she's very, uh, very <laughs> passionate about Birmingham. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, you know, we're doing quite a bit of work there too. So, but that, you can kind of see where this concept is going. Totally. And again, going back to the unification of private sector voices to be able to contribute properly to government discussion, I think is important. Correct. But also I think it helps it helps unify some of the government agencies themselves. Yes. Um, which it's not always easy for them to speak to one another, right? Um, Correct. In these sorts of formats. So maybe we can play a positive role there. But also for the government departments, and there are many <laughs> in New South Wales and in and the city of Sydney as well, but how can they talk with one voice for a precinct rather than having to go to every single business and operator? So the bid can coalesce the business view to work with government at different levels. But I think the six city strategies, it would be great to see a pilot of an id, not necessarily a bid in each of those six cities, to see what is working, what the scope is, what the opportunity, what outcomes you want. But I think the other piece here, and I've said this to ministers and various departments here, is make sure we actually put some capability and competence 
confidence into these ids as well. So mm. making sure we get the people to run these that understand the commercial dynamics but can work with the public sector as well. And what we were running uh, in the UK before I left was an academy actually to oh, really? really help uh, these places, you know, uh, to transform but actually put in really good management teams. So we ran a two year program, it was actually in Northern Ireland. So running an id school. An id school, exactly, <laughs> an academy and working uh, with Mosaic Partnerships there. And it was about actually working with the city council, the big, the big board effectively and the leadership team over two years to think about you know their business planning their KPIs their governance you know how they should deliver and actually taking them some pretty intense workshops to make sure they had the right structure and all of those bids in Northern Ireland went through actually after wow. a two-year program uh, so I hope something similar here we could think about for New South Wales as well that's really exciting I mean I, mm. I do get the sense there's a lot of goodwill and um, good faith in this concept yes because people want something like this yes and, and they're willing it to be successful so i think that's just a that's a wonderful basis to start with yes in a world where you know new ideas tend to get a lot of critique yeah, yeah. very early on and you know i'm sure this one does as well but it yes. is there seems to be a lot of will but i think also australia it perhaps wasn't the need wasn't there for the last two decades because actually city councils were doing very good job. You know, the state here does invest in the place. You know, I'm really struck. Often you say Australia's a backwater country, they don't think about place or innovation, but it's not like that. You've got some brilliant people here working in government, working in different forums, working in different setups. So I think the problem we're trying to solve is different now. As we've come out of COVID, as we think about cities, we think about sustainable and economic outcomes and social license to operate as business. You know, the need is different, but that's why I think bids 2.0 here is an opportunity for Australia, but we should lead the world in this, not follow. Yeah. And we've got that opportunity, I think, here to do yeah. that. And I, I'm, I agree with you. And since Len Lease has always wanted and believed itself to be a leader in this space, mm. but that's why our model has been successful overseas. Yes, because it's this view about precincts and place and urban renewal on a large scale. Yes, that is attractive to other countries. Yeah. and that's why we're in 14 different cities mm. using this type of model. Um, and I agree with you, I think that is now expanding to other, other types of projects, right? Uh, you know, I never heard much about place in residential projects, for example. Yes. Now that's a thing now, like, well, okay, people live there, but what else, what else, what's the amenity around this? Um, Correct. You know, the future of commercial office, you know, yes, you work yes. in an office, but what else happens right? around there? Yeah. I dropped my son off at, at, um, at the childcare center here at, um, Tower One, right? Oh, yes. Um, and he loves it because he's in the same building as his, as his mother. Yeah. He also great. works for PwC in that building. You're in a very concentrated area, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, you know, he thinks it's fantastic. He yeah. gets to come to work with us. Great. And he tells his sisters, I'm going with mummy and daddy. Bye, guys. Off you to know, work. I'm off to work, right? <laughs> yeah, great. So that's the sort of thing. How does life, how does a precinct totally. make life easier for the people that are part of it? But also, I think the opportunity here is we are not one sector. We have pockets of sectors, and Barangaroo is, is brilliant and commercial and sets the, the pace for the region, actually, in terms of what you're doing here. But we have the culture, the F&B, the entertainment. And I think a lot of cities trying to create this, we don't need to create this. No, it's we've got it. here. Yeah. So how do we leverage that? How do we build on that? We have all the ingredients of a, a, a true mixed-use precinct in all forms, but it's not seen as a mixed-use precinct. It's seen as one sub-precinct you're going to. So I think our, our task is to join that up. And we're an extension of the CBD. We're not different to the CBD, and we're an extension to West as well. So I think yeah. that's what we need to try and achieve in the period ahead. So and we need to mix our buildings up as well with different uses. A hundred percent. I think that is the future concept, totally. right? Particularly around adaptive reuse of, say, B-grade, buildings yes where maybe its use is no longer relevant yes there's some adaptive reuse questions there which we we, we can get into mm. um, but i do want to just touch on this data question yes so you've talked a bit about evidence right we make investments based on evidence yes how do you capture this evidence yeah, and I think this is a really unique space, again, where the bid and business work together. Because often in government, they do use data and evidence, but they, they have different metrics of their success. They're obviously thinking about the public good, and, and rightly so, in terms of citizens and community, where I think from the business side, of course we think about that, but we also think about a commercial return as well. So I think, you know, really understanding the precinct. And again, I was quite struck, and Jeff makes this point, our chairman, it's a dark precinct. People know bits of it, but not all of it as well. So we've had to think, how can we invest collectively 
to really understand the visitor, the user, the customer, the consumer of this precinct. And I have to say, I went to London Business School a few years ago, and it's really struck me that there's an opportunity here in all places and precincts to use data better. And I worked with PwC in London, and we got this program off the ground, which is one of the first in the world, where we were getting data from 100 different businesses trading in the area in real time of how they were performing, what was happening with the customer. But we could also extrapolate up to advanced analytics to really understand, well, what would happen if that asset was moved or that brand came in or how would that piece of infrastructure help? And that moved into the next level, which is when government was thinking about policy for an area, whether it was trading hours or licensing, data was starting to being used. So for us, taking sort of 10 years of that journey in London and doing it in one year here, I'm really pleased with the New Sydney Waterfront. The board invested in this right up front. We had a fantastic pilot with PwC to start to understand the opportunity, but also the customer. We did a global tender uh, to take us to the next stage, and Collie has won that, so we can really now start to process data across all the seven sub-precincts and also the forward forecasting, which I think for us to really understand that from an asset management point of view, from an operator point of view, it's just not there. It's something that is really value adding to these businesses. And already I've got a range of restaurateurs and, and uh, hoteliers saying, how do we get this? We want to understand this. So there's yeah. almost a competition for this. But for us to really understand that and develop our program on the back of that is so important. So you start with the evidence here. You have the ambition with the hearts there. And that's how we're going to get on that journey Aren't together. Aren't they worried about sharing information and competitive dynamics and all that sort of stuff? They absolutely are. And I think when you can demonstrate, which we've done in London, how it is value adding, how you're not giving away IP of your individual business, that you're getting something that you couldn't necessarily get yourself, people very quickly get on board with it and understand the value of it as well. And I think once we start to see the data coming out sort of February, March time next year, I think we're going to see a wave of demand for this. But also we can be really smart in how we allocate our capital during this voluntary stage on the projects and programs that are going to live some value in, in the short term, but also thinking about our five-year business strategy. What are the problems we're trying to solve? What's going to shift the dial for visitors coming here? We want them to be here longer, spend more time, use the whole precinct. We can now understand through both the qual and the quant data what are going to be the levers for that as well. So mm. I think there's such a, as Minister Stokes says, where the magic can happen, the magic is going to happen here with that data in the, in the months and years ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think data informs everything, really. If you've mm. got it, you then, it's more than the vibe Right? Yeah. Or Marbo is the phrase is, is that it? used. The Vibe or Marbo. Have you hey. seen that film? No. The Castle? No. It's oh. the first film I was asked to watch when I, or told to watch when I arrived in Australia. Tell him he's dreaming, right? Is that the Tell one? him he's dreaming. Yeah, I need to watch it again. Yeah. It's a long time ago. It was a brilliant film. <laughs> and yeah, it, yeah. it's uh, yeah, probably, probably entirely politically incorrect these days, but yes, it was yeah. a great film. Okay. Um, so, change of tact. Hmm. What's the craziest thing that's happened to you as a a bid CEO, so everything's very serious, you're very corporate. Yes. But this, <laughs> this whole thing with government in particular mm. and pulling people together will bound to have got you some crazy story. <laughs> Did you get stuck on a zip line like Boris? Or, you I've know? got a Boris story which might be entertaining <laughs> for, the, for the listeners and the viewers. I've got another story as well. But um, look, Boris was mayor of London uh, and he was a terrific mayor of London. We couldn't have had a, a better flag bearer, you know, literally waving the flag in Beijing, if you remember, yes. you know, before okay. the Olympic Games. Didn't get stuck anything there, but got stuck a bit later on the zip wire. But um, we did a lot with Boris and his administration and he really supported the bid. And Sadiq Khan, our new mayor, equally so. So it's great across politics Not as so well. Not so new, right? He's been there well now, Sadiq. Sadiq actually yeah, is into his third term now, yeah. I think. But a great, again, great advocate for the bids and wrote to Clover Moore actually saying, look, you're really yeah, embracing, yeah, which that was is great. terrific. But I remember we were getting ready for the Olympics actually in, in 2012 and uh, we had this great project to clean up the West End, literally clean it up, clean up the streets and uh, literally sweeping and dusting and then cleaning off buildings and, and making it look really sparkly and, and new for all our visitors coming in. And we had Boris down, meant to be with a broom, uh, coming to clean up Oxford Street. But uh, I turned up. And I've never seen so many camera crews and media. Oh. And I was like, wow, the PR agency have done a terrific job on this. You know, it might have been a couple of snappers once, you know, with Boris with a broom. But literally, I felt like every media was there. And uh, unfortunately for Boris, it was the day they announced he may have an extra child that no one knew about <laughs> as well. Uh, and everyone wanted to come and talk to the mayor about that. So you can imagine the headlines. You have know. they actually ever defined how many children Boris has? It's or still an unknown. Still an unknown. We'll, we'll have to wait for the book. But it was literally <laughs> Boris sweeping it under the carpet in terms of the child, which wasn't the best headline. Oh, uh, but that was a, an interesting morning we had to manage that. So for a moment there, you actually thought that this was really about you, but it wasn't. It was correct. about Boris's children. <laughs> correct, correct. 
Yeah. But the other one, I remember when we were doing Bond Street, actually, um, we had to work with a lot of international retailers. And you think like Richemont and Louis Vuitton, they are very protective of their brand and their heritage. It, it's ultimate luxury as well. And I remember sitting with the, uh, the president of uh, Richemont, it was Cartier that we were talking about. And Cartier, if people have been to Bond Street, there's a beautiful space outside Cartier and Ralph Lauren, which was full of traffic and actually it wasn't maximizing what it could do there. So part of our proposals, and we worked with an amazing company called Publica uh, that thought about the public space and recreating a street with traffic, but into a beautiful town square in the middle of London. If you go there now, you would think you're in mm. the middle of somewhere in Europe, actually, uh, right with the Royal Academy. But we said that we need a million pounds, uh, Cartier, yeah, and Richemont to invest in this collectively. We want to create a beautiful town square outside of your boutique. And then he sort of said in a very French way, well, why should I, why should I invest in this? And they're very passionate. I don't know if you've seen Cartier. They have this panther uh, with the jewelry, and it's, it's very iconic oh, yeah, yeah. every Christmas. And they put a nice big uh, a diamond. Your wife, well, your wife might like that, Jason. I'm sure she day. would. <laughs> I'm sure she would. And I sort of said, look. Thanks for giving her that idea, Jason. I yeah, really quite. appreciate it. Got a lovely Cartier store that's just opened, actually, yeah. haven't we, in, uh, in Sydney. But um, I said to him, look, you want to be the most iconic building in London here. By putting this town square here, you'll be the most Instagrammable street every Christmas. I can guarantee you that. And sure enough, uh, we did the development and we looked at the figures and it is the most Instagrammable street in London now with that iconic panther outside the Cartier store. So sometimes you have to sort of take a bit of imagination uh, and creativity to get these guys to go on the journey with you as well. You do, I, I agree. I mean, the, the sort of grammable moment has become such a thing, right? Yes. And so now precincts sort of need these, these things. Correct. Right. But think about here, yes, it's the Opera House and the Bridge, we're not filming what happened on the waterfront and actually yeah. thinking about the iconic buildings and the powerhouse. Wouldn't it be incredible if this becomes the third icon of the city? The powerhouse, I'm a big fan of that power station. I just think it will, it will, be, it will be a gift for Sydney if it's done well. Completely right, um, completely right. And you know, we've got such a wonderful opportunity. And the one thing we haven't touched on is mm. the fact that it is a waterfront. Mm. Like people love water. Yes. This country in particular is obsessed with water. Yes. Anything facing water is <laughs> desirable. Yeah, right? 100%. And I'm not sure if that's the case elsewhere. It certainly it is in Hong Kong, where I'm from, but yes. it, you know, in other cities, but uh, you know, in Australia, in this, in mm. this city in particular, water is king. Absolutely. And we've got we are a, a harbour city. <laughs> yeah, we are a harbour city. We are a harbour company often, I, I argue. Yes, yes. Because we've done so much around here. But, but in the Western Harbour, we've got the water, right? And I think somebody made the point on the board that if this was the only harbour we had, yes. it would have all the attention. Correct. But actually, because there's two parts to it and, and all the pretty stuff at the moment is on the eastern side, people yes. forget that we've got this. Correct, area. correct. And not to mention North Sydney and all those other areas, all of which is sort of water-based. So yeah. There's so much potential. Completely, and I think it's a very interesting relationship we have with the water. So we've worked with Urbis, which I'm sure your, your viewers and your listeners know about yeah. Urbis. They do some incredible work. Kate, Kate there Merrick, in particular. Yeah, who's also coming on this podcast at some point. Oh, so. brilliant. You know, I am in good company, actually, you Jason. Are. This is great. It's, um, it's hard to pin her down, though, because she sort of runs around. At she's very global <laughs> at the moment as well. Very global. But I think part of their work was to look at what are these great waterfronts doing around the world? What has worked? What hasn't worked? And I'm quite struck here, we have an odd relationship with the water here. We sort of stop at it, it's a hard stop, we don't really engage with it. Mm. There's been lots of talk around how, again, the cultural ribbon or the water could actually go into the water and we embrace the water and we think about playing with the water. So there's an absolute opportunity there to think about the water in a different way. But the other thing that's really become apparent in the six weeks that I've been here, we just don't connect across the water and through mm. the precincts. Yeah. And there's such an opportunity in a really modern way to do that. Uh, and I saw some wonderful stuff. The Biennale did this thing actually in Europe where you could literally walk on water through this art piece. You could actually yeah, yeah this yeah, maze yeah. going through. I was saying to Anita and Susan at Placemaking, you know, wouldn't that be wonderful to do that in Darling Harbour, for example? So I think we've got to be more creative with how we use the water Absolutely. and those opportunities. And also getting across the water, I think, is a good point. Right? Yes, you know, yes. So the ferry, the iconic, you know, green and yellow Sydney ferry. Yes. We could use that a lot more like there's no reason why we can't have sort of a shuttle service you know across different parts of this harbor 100 percent. and when i again when i first came here there was this red bus i was called and it was a <laughs> kind of all stops red bus which tourists would get on and oh, take yeah, them to different yeah, yeah. parts of george street and whatever else yes it kind of worked right yeah i don't see why we can't do that here in uh, in this part of the harbor where you have a, a ferry that takes people around Totally, because the Hopper Ferry, to take you around the precinct. Hop, hopper Ferry, or what, I think Brisbane has one actually. Oh uh, yeah, great. Um, and so- And electric, I think we need to be electric, electric. and 
for staff that work here as well. 50,000 people work here, yeah, as well as our visitors as well. And if we can make it free, all the better, right? Totally right. And um, I think this is actually you know, something quite tangible I'm hoping the bid can deliver because the next two years, we've got to try a few projects. We haven't got a huge amount of capital. And my big invitation to all your listeners, if you're a if business here or your own property here, get involved, you know, particularly at this early stage as well. But we need to deliver a few carrots, if you like, of what the opportunity is in the precinct through the bid code. And I think the electric ferry idea is one of those amongst others as well. Mm. To really show if this works and customers respond and visitors respond well to this, then we can scale this in the future as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Look, there's, there's so many angles we can go to. We'll have to end soon. Mm. So I'll end with this. I'll, you know, you've been back, was it six weeks? Six weeks, yeah. yeah. After being away for 25 years, <laughs> yes. you've had 100 meetings, you've been to lots of different cities here, talking about bids, you've met, you know, remarkably, uh, you know, all of the sort of people involved in the governance of the city yes. you know, very quickly, which is, which is good. They um, all know you, Jason. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I must say, I won't say what they say about you, but they well, say yeah, I was you. about to say, I was about to say, they may know me, but <laughs> I hesitate to think what they say. Um, what are your observations mm. at a high level? What do you think our challenges are? And how do you see the bid helping to address those challenges? Yeah, not a small question. Yes, and it's a thoughtful one, you know, and I think it's good as we sort of get to the end of the year and think about it. But I think your early observation, there is huge passion to change the way we deliver in precincts. You know, everyone is bought into the principle of that. I think the how, the what, the remit is still to be determined, but we are starting from an incredibly good base across the public and private sector, which is great. I think the observation on the Western Harbour is pretty consistent. They see there are good parts of it, but there is the opportunity, which is generational opportunity. And not just for Sydney, but for the country, what this could deliver and what this could be in terms of best practice globally, in terms of how we think about the waterfront. And by the way, the sunsets on this side, this is why it's a better waterfront as well, <laughs> because you have that. Yeah. So I think there is definitely a coalition there. And I think people want to start seeing the bid deliver. I think for us, the next couple of years is actually delivering on some programs, showing the momentum, having the vision, but actually getting out the door. Because a lot of these types of organisations, they, they have deep thinking and a lot of sort of ideas, papers, if you like. But we've got to get on and deliver, but work with the state government, with the city council, who are really willing to work with us in this space and deliver some tangible outcomes for them but also for these businesses. So I really think we're in, starting in a really good spot, probably the best spot I've started with any bid I've worked in around the world, actually. But I think, you know, we've got to scale up, we've got to get some more resource, and we've got to prove this concept. But I can't wait to get this rolling out across the country, not just here in Sydney as well. Excellent. Well, that's a, that's a great point. And Jace Turrell, thank you so much for, for being part of Smarter Cities. Thank you.